So we're on our final week of our Picture per- Perfect Sermon Series, and, and I want to start where we ended last week, because we ended our time with the idea of the Picture Perfect Self and the realization that that, that self was the one who was listening to the sermon in the moment. Because the picture-perfect self, if you will, is the one who is loved by God and redeemed in our Savior Jesus Christ. Now, I know there are areas in which we all have improvement that is needed. Areas for myself would include things like pride and arrogance and patience and and faithfulness, healthy disciplines and habits and boundaries and I'm sure your own list is similar and maybe a few others, but again, understanding that our picture perfect self is the one who is loved by God does not exclude the reality that we all have areas in our lives in which we need to grow and improve. But on the contrary, knowing that I am freely loved should actually set us free to pursue growth and pursue improvement in those areas of our lives in the truth and love of God because we're not trying to earn or deserve anything from Him. We already have everything that we need in Him, in His love, in our Savior. So be honest with me. Did you write that phrase on your mirror last week? Raise your hand if you did. Yeah, me neither. And that's why I wanted to launch off from that point today. Because over the past century, thanks to our popular media, we've gotten a few examples of the picture-perfect family. We've also gotten lots of examples, especially in the recent decades, of the not-picture-perfect family. And many times, it's important to note, creators of those movies and and those shows that we are trying to consume are trying to make it more like the reality that their audience experiences day in and day out. So they show the dysfunction. They show the dystopia that exists in families. But even with that desire to be authentic and real, we still have these cultural icons of picture-perfect families in our media today. For many of you sitting here, that family would have been the cleavers from Leave It to Beaver in the 20th century. Dad worked every day while mom stayed home and cared for the kids, cleaned the house and made sure everything was good in good working order so that by the time dad made it home, he could read his paper, he could eat his dinner, and then he could go sit in his chair for the rest of the evening. Many of you even grew up with this dynamic in your own homes. And of course, occasionally in Leave it to Beaver, the brothers would get in an argument. After all, it was television, so they had to make some kind of drama, right? But inevitably, by the end of the episode and the change of the music, the brothers would have it all worked out, wouldn't they? So then the family was able to sit around the table, eat their dinner, and have good conversation and good homemade food. In today's modern media, the picture-perfect family, ironically, is probably not human, (laughs) It's probably from the Disney show, Bluey. And there are similarities. There's a mom and a dad. There's two siblings that play, and sometimes they get upset with each other. But in Bluey, they work it out by the end of a 10-minute episode. So see, we've improved in the 21st century. But there are some differences as well, right? The primary differences are, are that both mom and dad appear to have jobs and work outside of the home. Both mom and dad split responsibility of caring for and raising the children in their home, even to the point that in many episodes of Bluey, dad is the one who is seemingly more involved in the lives of his girls than the mom sometimes seems to be. The show depicts dad playing constant games with kids, teaching them life lessons, taking them to the store, all while mom is doing these things, but she's able to go out with her friends. She's able to go play a game of tennis or being able to do chores around the house without being bothered or disturbed. Talk about picture-perfect ideals. (laughs) And ultimately, both shows have a family that occasionally has differences, but they can work it out. And they can always work it out through play and calm conversation 
and even deeper concepts like mercy and reconciliation. I think there's a lot of positive that's shown in those two families. There's encouragement from both of them to seek peace and calm in the family. And and in Bluey, they do often hit those bigger concepts, even though it's written primarily for children under the age of six. But it talks about those bigger concepts that sometimes lead to the dysfunctions that we all know in our family. As a dad, though, I struggle with Bluey. Not because I don't really care for the show, but because, man... If you've ever watched a 10-minute episode of Bluey as a dad, you feel guilt and shame. Because I, for one, am not able to play constant games with my children. I have creaks and aches in my joints already. I I often cannot explain patiently adult-level concepts to my children in ways that they always have that light bulb moment. And I certainly can't do it in 10 minutes or less. And even to this day, when Victoria leaves the house and I'm alone with my kids, please don't tell her this, sometimes I still get anxious. How am I going to keep all five of us alive? And given all the social media threads that exist around Bluey, I know that I am not the only dad that experiences this. But I know it does the same for moms, too. And grandparents, you're certainly not left out of this. Because for many of you, you struggle because you see your children raising their children and you feel the guilt and the shame that there is more that you could have done, more you could have taught them. Maybe you wish you could have set them up better in life. Maybe you wish you could have been there more often for them. Or maybe you wish you could better support them now. And yet I also know that there are still many of you who have not talked to family members for months or even years now because of dysfunctions and behaviors that exist in your family. There are families that have stayed together for all the wrong reasons because they're afraid, because they're anxious. They've done it for the children. They've done it out of a feeling of obligation. And then there are families that have broken apart for all the wrong reasons, for infidelity, for addictions, for death, for guilt. So yet again, we end up where we've ended up every week in this series. There is no picture-perfect family. And we know that that statement is true. Because if it wasn't, for starters, we wouldn't be listening to this sermon. And also, if that statement wasn't true, we would not have a need for our Savior, Jesus Christ. In our reading from Psalm 127, we hear the, the psalmist speak to the joy of a household built in faith and love. But I think too many of us have heard of that verse about children being a quiver of arrows. And one, we've thought, what is a quiver of arrows? And secondly, we've scoffed at the concept, or we wish we could say the same thing about our own children. So I'd encourage you to grab your Bibles. Grab the Bible in front of you, grab your phone or your tablet, and go with me to Ephesians chapter 5. If you've been at peace for any amount of time, you've probably caught on a time or two that I am a big fan of Paul's letter to the Ephesians. But it's for a good reason. Because I think throughout his letter to the Ephesians, Paul actually addresses almost every aspect of a disciple's life and the grace and the truth of Jesus Christ. So Ephesians chapter 5, skip down to verse 31. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31. He starts in this part with a quote from Genesis chapter 2. He says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, and they shall hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Okay, I will start by saying there is a lot in this passage that if we start going down, we will not get out at 9.30. I promise. Okay, so we are not going to cover all of that in our sermon today. And there's a lot that gets misunderstood in this passage. But look again at verse 32. He says, This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. 
The mystery that he's talking about is what he just said in verse 31. That a man shall leave his father and mother and he shall cleave to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. He's talking about marriage. That marriage is a mystery that is profound and it is referring to Christ and his church. Paul is not writing to perfect marriages. And Paul is not writing to perfect people. He's writing to sin-filled people redeemed in the love of Jesus Christ just like you and I. So when Paul says that he's talking about a profound mystery that represents Christ in the church, he's writing to husbands who may have mistreated their wives, who may have abused their wives, who may have cheated on them, who most likely chose their own selfish desires over the needs and the desires of their wife. But he's also talking to wives who have hated their husbands in their hearts who have most likely disrespected their husbands, who have refused to listen to their husbands, who may have cheated on their husbands. And he says that those marriages are a mystery that is profound and represents Christ and his church. How? If you're married, please pay attention. If you're not married, you don't get the next 20 minutes off. I need you to listen to, because I need you to encourage the marriages that are around you. Paul is not saying that we should seek a marriage without conflict or without strife, because he knows it's impossible. And he knows Jesus came because we all have a need for a Savior. But what Paul is actually saying is that your marriage... Or the marriages of those around you, be it your kids, or your grandkids, or your neighbors, or your co-workers. All of those marriages are opportunities to show the world the grace and the mercy that we know in our Savior Jesus Christ. Because as He has forgiven each of us without hesitation in His death and resurrection, so husbands and wives can freely forgive one another too. And in the brokenness and the pain that occurs in the most intimate of relationships, in the darkest darkness, the light of our Savior Jesus Christ can shine brightly to the world around us when husband and wife seek reconciliation and forgiveness. If you really want to be a good news presence in your daily life, I would encourage you to start with the most intimate relationship you have. I know as a pastor and as a husband, there are incredible struggles in marriage. And there are times I know where it seems that reconciliation is simply not possible. But as disciples of Jesus, we should seek every opportunity, every avenue, every means to show the grace and mercy of our Savior in our marriages. And as disciples of Jesus, we should seek every opportunity, every avenue, every means to show the grace and mercy of our Savior in our relationships. Go down to Ephesians 6. Verse 1, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, and this is the first commandment with a promise. He's referring to Exodus 20 that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Verse 4, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. Public service announcement, if you don't know it, parenting is hard. And I think far too many generations have read this passage to understand that children should be quiet and submissive and always respond exactly how their parents demand they respond. And dads, you can never be angry with your children. You can never frustrate your children. Moms, well, Paul doesn't mention you, so you treat your kids however you want to treat them. (laughs) Yeah, that's not it. Parents, it is your responsibility to teach your children what it means to live as disciples of Jesus. 
But we talk about this in our baptism, right, don't we? That mom and dad, you have the primary responsibility because you are the one around your child the most to teach them what it means to live as a disciple of Jesus. But you do it as the Spirit of God is forming your own faith and your own life as His disciple through every struggle, every joy, every pain. You do it in your marriage when you and your, res- your spouse respond to each other. Remember what we just talked about? You do it as a parent when you admit that you're wrong and that you need forgiveness, you need reconciliation. Because by the way, discipline here, as Paul uses it, is not rebuke. It's not punishment. Discipline is actually instruction in teaching. It is actually experience that is learned. So you're not going to do it perfectly, mom and dad. Period. You're not. Grandparents, you didn't do it perfectly either, or you wouldn't have the children that you have. And your children will not parent perfectly either. And when we seek forgiveness, when we seek reconciliation, we give them the opportunity to experience the grace and the mercy that is so freely poured out in our Savior Jesus Christ. And we actually teach them more about the faith in our Savior than if they memorize the entirety of Scripture. Because they get to experience love and grace. Now children, I need you to raise your hand because I know you're here. Kiddos, raise your hand. I need you to listen, and I need you to listen closely. Every person sitting in this room has been and or currently is still a child to their parents. Okay? Mom and dad will never do it perfectly. I promise. (laughs) They have emotions too. I know it's crazy to think about, but mom and dad actually get angry. They become impatient. Sometimes they're just tired and they need a nap. Sometimes they're hungry. Sometimes they're hangry and anxious and they're afraid and unsure. And even mom and dad lack confidence. So you and I as kids get to live out the fourth commandment. We honor our father and our mother by, yes, obeying them when they ask us to do things like clean our room. But we also honor them by showing them mercy and grace. To remind them that they are loved in Jesus Christ too. So be helpful to them. Be encouraging them to, to them as mom and dad. You know what? Even look at them and say, way to go mom and dad. <laughs> and obey them when they ask you to. But please, children, please. Remind mom and dad that they are loved by Jesus too. Because the picture perfect family or self or lifestyle is not possible. It simply is not possible in a sin filled, broken world. But our Savior came for us to remind us that in His mercy, in His grace, in His love, it covers all of our sins. And that in His grace and reconciliation and transformation, hope is possible. In the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.